Hello, Booktube. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. Uh, there is a Booktube event called Holmes is Where the Heart Is. It is a celebration of Sherlock Holmes in all kinds of forms. And I love the event. I'm not one of the co-hosts, but I'm an, an, an enthusiastic cheerer from the sidelines. I've read Sherlock Holmes more times than I can count. He is absolutely essential to my reading. And yesterday, I read uh, the prop. The first prop for for Holmes is where the heart is. Is to read something from the long canon, meaning the four longer Sherlock Holmes works that Arthur Conan Doyle wrote himself. And the most famous of those by far, and one of the most famous books ever written, is The Hound of the Baskervilles. <laughs> so I chose that, of course. At first, I thought, uh, well, I would just, you know, read it and maybe maybe make a video about it at some point or other. And then I thought, you know. I'm already reading you aloud from a book right now. Why not read from Holy Scripture? <laughs> uh, so I thought, just on a lark, that I would read you the first chapter of The Hound of the Basketball. Of course, read when I read aloud on this channel, it's not just it's not just me reading the book aloud. It's it's me adding commentary, which I I have apologized for it for years, years. I have been doing this when we were reading Trollope. I would in interpolate commentary all along. And then apologize. And over the, for years now, all of you have been emailing and leaving Voxer messages and saying, don't apologize. That's why we really like that. Uh, but I thought that was it. I thought I would just read chapter one of The Hound of the Baskervilles and then we'd move on. Uh, but <laughs> I got a lot of commentary. A lot of commentary. A lot. I don't know. I haven't checked how many comments there are on that video. But I got a ton of emails from people saying, please keep going, please keep reading The Hound of the Baskervilles. And I also got a ton of Voxer messages. Uh, one in particular, which I, I, my, I was pretty much decided to do, to go on and do this anyway after a few emails, but I got a Voxer message from, from little Amy and little Emily and little Kathy, who were told all to say in unison, please. <laughs> Okay. All right. well, you did a wonderful job, girls. So this chapter is for you. We will now be continuing with The Hound of the Baskervilles here in my Magnum Easy Eye edition. Trust me, this is a battered old paperback, but no book on your shelf has any dreams any higher than this. That you, humble as it is, you pull it down off the shelf and read it out loud to a whole bunch of people who are happy to hear it. That is heaven for a book. Uh, so we are up to chapter two which is The Curse of the Baskervilles. Keep in mind, uh, a country doctor has come to Sherlock Holmes with a problem. He has an old manuscript, and he has a problem, but he swears to Holmes that his problem is very much in the real world. It's not, it's not literary. It's not documentary. I have in my pocket a manuscript, said Dr. James Mortimer. I observed it as you entered the room, said Holmes. It is an old manuscript. Early 18th century, unless it is a forgery. How can you say that, sir? You have presented an inch or two of it to my inspection all, all the time that you have been talking. It would be a poor expert who could not give the date of the document within a decade or so. You may possibly have read my little monograph upon the subject. I put that at 1730. The exact date is 1742. Dr. Mortimer drew it from his breast pocket. This family paper was committed to my care by Sir Charles Baskerville, whose sudden and tragic death some three months ago created so much excitement in Devonshire. I may say that I was his personal friend as well as his medical attendant. He was a strong-minded man, sir, shrewd, practical, and as unimaginative as I am myself. Yet he took this document very seriously, and his mind was prepared for just such an end as did eventually overtake him. What possible connection can there be between a document in the 18th century and this guy's death? Holmes stretched out his hand for the manuscript and flattened it upon his knee. You will observe, Watson, the, al the alternative use of the long S and the short. It is one of several indications which enabled me to fix the date. You didn't fix the date, Sherlock. You were wrong. <laughs> uh, I looked over his shoulder at the yellow paper and the faded script. At the head was written, Baskerville Hall, and below, in large scrawling figures, 1742. It appears to be a statement of some sort. Yes, it is a statement of a certain legend which runs in the Baskerville family. But I understand that it is something more modern and practical upon which you wish to consult me. More modern, uh, most modern, of most practical pressing matter which must be decided within 24 hours. But the manuscript is short and it is intimately connected with the affair. With your permission, I will read it to you. 
Holmes leaned back in his chair, placed his fingertips together, and closed his eye with an air of resignation. Dr. Mortimer turned the manuscript to the light and read in a high, crackling voice the following curious old-world narrative. And then we get the narrative, which I will read to you in a high, crackling voice. <laughs> Over the origin of the Hound of the Baskervilles, there have been many statements yet. Yet I come in, in it. I come, as I come in a direct line from Hugo Baskerville, and as I had the story from my father, who also had it from his, I've set it down with all belief that it occurred even here as set forth. And I would have you believe, my sons, that the same justice which punishes sins may also most graciously forgive it, and that no ban is so heavy but that by prayer and repentance it may be removed. Learn, then, from this story not to fear the fruits of the past, but rather to be circumspect in the future, that those foul passions whereby our family has suffered so grievously may not again be loosed to our undoing. Know then that in the time of the Great Rebellion, the history of which by the learned Lord Clarendon I most earnestly commend to your attention, I will add here that I also commend Clarendon's history of the Rebellion to your attention. Good luck. It's probably on Project Gutenberg. Uh, this manor of Baskerville was held by Hugo of that name, nor can it be gainsaid that he was a most wild, profane, and godless man. This, in truth, his neighbors might have pardoned, seeing that saints have never flourished in those parts. But there was in him a certain wanton and cruel humor, which made his name a byword throughout the West. It chanced that this Hugo came to love, if indeed so dark a passion may be known under so bright a name. A daughter of a yeoman who held lands near the Baskerville estate. But the young maiden, being discreet and of good repute, would ever avoid him, for she feared his evil name. So it came to pass that one Michaelmas, this Hugo, with five or six of his idle and wicked companions, stole down upon the farm and carried off the maiden, her father and brothers being from home, as he well knew. When they had brought her to the hall, the maiden was placed in an upper chamber, while Hugo and his friends sat down to a long carouse, as was their nightly custom. Now the poor lass upstairs was like to have her wits turned at the singing and shouting and terrible oaths which came up to her from below, for they say that the words used by Hugo Baskerville when he was in wine were such as might blast the man who said them. I ask anybody who's been here for wine and Kelzones at Hyde Cottage, I do the same. <laughs> Except I don't have to worry about any hound. Out of the Baskervilles or not. <laughs> I don't have to worry about any of them. Uh, at last, in the stress of her fear, she did that which might have daunted the bravest and most active man. For by the aid and of the growth of ivy which covers, and still covers, the south wall, she came down from under the eaves and so homeward across the moor, there being three leagues betwixt the hall and her father's farm. She crawls down the ivy that's growing on the outside walls of the keep. It chanced that some little time later Hugo left his guest to carry food and drink with other worse things, perchance. You girls, that might mean he's going to make her kiss him. Uh -huh. To his captive, and so found the cage empty, and the bird escaped. Then, as it would seem, he became as one that hath a devil, for rushing down the stairs into the dining hall, he sprang upon the great table, flagons and trenchers flying before him. And he cried aloud before all the company that he would that very night render his body and soul to the powers of evil, if he might but overtake the wench. And while the revelers stood aghast at the fury of the man, one more wicked, or it may be more drunken than the rest, cried out that they should put the hounds upon her, that they should chase her with the hounds he uses to chase stag. Whereat Hugo ran from the house, crying to his grooms that they should saddle his mare and unkennel the pack. And giving the hounds a kerchief of the maids, he swung them into lo to the line, so off full cry in the moonlight over the moor. In other words, he gives them one of her handkerchiefs so that they can get the scent, so they know what they're looking for. They can follow the trail. Now, for some space, the revelers stood agape, unable to understand all that had been done in such haste. But anon, their bemused wits awoke to the nature of the deed which was like to be done upon the moorlands. Everything was now in an uproar some calling for their pistols, some for their horses, some for another flask of wine. But at length some sense came back to their crazed minds, and the whole of them, thirteen in number, took horse and started in pursuit. The moon shone clear above them, and they rode swiftly abreast, taking that course which the maid must needs have taken if she were to reach her own home. They had gone a mile or two when they passed one of the night shepherds upon the moorlands, and they cried to him to know if he had seen the hunt. And the man, as the story goes, was so crazed with fear that he could scarcely speak, but at last he said that he was indeed seeing the unhappy maiden with the hounds upon her track. But I have seen more than that, said he, 
For Hugo Baskerville passed me upon his black mare, and there ran mute behind him such a hound of hell as God forbid should ever be at my heels. So the drunken squires cursed the shepherd and rode onwards, but soon their skins turned cold, for there came a galloping across the moor the black mare, dabbled with white froth, went past with trailing bridle and empty saddle. Then the revelers rode close together, for a great fear was on them, but they still followed over the moor, though each, had he been alone, would have been right glad to have turned his horse's head. Riding slowly in this fashion, they came at last upon the hounds. These, though known for their valor and their breed, were whimpering in a cluster at the head of a deep dip, or goyal, as we call it, upon the moor, some slinking away, and some, with the starting hackles and staring eyes, gazing down the narrow valley before them. As the company had come to halt, more sober men, as you may guess, than when they started, the most, of the, most, the most of them would by no means advance, but three of them, the boldest, or it may be the most drunken, rode forward down the Goyal. Now it opened into a broad space in which stood two of those great stones, still to be seen there, which were set by certain forgotten peoples in days of old. The moon was shining bright upon the clearing, and there in the center lay the unhappy maid, where she had fallen, dead of fear or fatigue. But it was not the sight of her body, nor yet was it the body of Hugo Baskerville lying near her, which raised the hair upon their heads of these three daredevil roisterers. But it was that, standing over Hugo, plucking at his throat, there stood a foul thing, a great black beast, shaped like a hound, yet larger than any hound that ever mortal eye has rested upon. And even as they looked, the thing tore the throat out of Hugo Baskerville, upon which, as it turned its blazing eyes and dripping jaws upon them, the three shrieked with fear and rode for dear life, still screaming across the moor. One, it is said, died that very night of what he had seen, and the other twain were but broken men for the rest of their days. Such is a tale, my son, of the coming of the hound, which is said to have plagued the family so sorely ever since. If I have yet if I have set it down, it is because that which is clearly known hath less terror than that which is but hinted at and guessed. Nor can it be denied that many of the family which had been happy in their have been unhappy in their deaths, which have been sudden, bloody, and mysterious. Yet may we shelter ourselves in the infinite goodness of providence, which would not forever punish the innocent beyond the third or fourth generation which is threatened in holy writ. To that providence, my sons, I hereby commend you, and I counsel you by way of caution to forbear from crossing the moor in those dark hours when the powers of evil are exalted. That's the document. This, this is the, the attestation. This from Hugo Baskerville to his sons Roger and John, with instructions that they say nothing thereof to their sister Elizabeth. <laughs> A little bit of Victorian sexism there for your for your entertainment. She doesn't get to be warned. <laughs> uh, maybe she won't ever be in the moor. Maybe she'll just be cooking. <laughs> when Dr. Mortimer had finished reading this singular narrative, he pushed his spectacles up on his forehead and stared across at Mr. Sherlock Holmes. The latter yawned and tossed the end of his cigarette into the fire. Well, said he, do you not find it interesting? To a collector of fairy tales... Dr. Mortar drew a folded newspaper out of his pocket. He's got a lot of stuff on him, hasn't he? Uh, he's remembering all these things, but he forgot his walking stick. And we still haven't heard a word about his dog. I don't know everything about his dog. Now, Mr. Holmes, will we, give, we will give you something a little more recent. This is the Devon County Chronicle of May 14th of this year. Oh, local newspapers. <laughs> How I miss them. Uh, does your town have a local newspaper? Oh, and does it do local stuff? I mean, do they take local writing, or is it all just copied from wire services? Anyway, <laughs> uh, it is a short account of the facts elicited at the death of Sir Charles Baskerville, which occurred a few days before that date. My friend leaned a little forward, and his expression became intent. This Sherlock Holmes understands. He doesn't care about old, old legends, but he knows very much about police reports and newspaper accounts. Our visitor re excuse me, readjusted his glasses and began, so we get more reading. The recent sudden death of Sir Charles Baskerville, whose name has been mentioned as the probable liberal candidate for the mid-Devon at the next election, has cast a gloom over the county. Though Sir Charles had resided at Baskerville Hall for a comparatively short period, in his, his amiability of character and extreme generosity had won the affection and respect of all who had been brought into contact with him. In these days of nouveau riche, it is refreshing to find a case where the scion of an old country family 
which has fallen upon evil days, is able to make his own fortune and come back and bring it back with him to restore the fallen grandeur of his line. So Sir Charles is of the old Baskerville family, but he's left, he left home and made a pile of money. And he's brought it back, and is being very generous to the community. Sir Charles, as is well known, made large sums of money in South, American specula in South African speculation. Let's not think too hard about that. <laughs> Let's just move straight on. Uh, more wise than those who go on until the wheel turns against them, he realized his gains and returned to England with them. It is only two years since he took up his residence at Baskerville Hall, and it is common talk how large were those schemes of reconstruction and improvement which have been interrupted by his death. Being himself childless, it was his openly expressed desire that the whole countryside should, within his own lifetime, profit by his good fortune and many will have personal reasons for bewailing his untimely end. His generous donations to local and county charities have been frequently chronicled in these columns. The circumstances connected with the death of Sir Charles cannot be said to have been entirely cleared up by the inquest, but at least enough has been done to dispose of those rumors which, have, which local superstition have given rise. There is no reason whatever to suspect foul play, or to imagine that death could have been from anything but natural causes. Sir Charles was a widower, and a man who may be said to have been in some ways of eccentric habit of mind. In spite of his considerable wealth, he was simple in his personal tastes, and his indoor servants at Baskerville Hall consisted of a married couple named Barrymore, the husband acting as a butler and the wife as a housekeeper. Okay, but keep in mind, Arthur Conan Doyle never puts anything in a story that doesn't belong there. Keep that in mind. What do we know? What is very important here? Okay, it's very important to know that Sir Charles Baskerville was very generous, but it also might be very important to know that he didn't grow up at the hall. He hasn't been there in years, just two years. What about all the people who are in the neighborhood who have been around all that time? Just saying. Uh, their evidence, corroborated by that of several friends, tends to show that Sir Charles's health had for some time been impaired, and points especially to some affliction of the heart, manifesting itself in changes of color, breathlessness, and acute attacks of nervous depression. Dr. James Mortimer, the friend and medical attendant of the deceased, has given evidence to the same effect. And he is the one reading the account. The facts of these cases are simple. Sir Charles Baskerville was in the habit every night before going to bed of walking down the famous yew alley of Baskerville Hall. The yew is a tree. There's just a long row of trees on, on probably on either side. Just a, a wonderful promenade, probably with, with soil or maybe gravel in between them. A lovely way to take in the evening. Go all the way there, all the way down the yew alley to the old stone gate. Pause, look out over the moorland where nothing can live, where it's bleak. If you haven't ever seen a moor, it's pretty wild. Uh, and then you make your way back to home. Uh, the evidence of the Barrymore shows that this had been his custom. On the 4th of May, Sir Charles had declared that his intention of starting next day for London and had ordered Barrymore to prepare his luggage. That night he went out as usual for his nocturnal walk, in the course of which he was in the habit of smoking a cigar, which can't have done wonders for a bad heart. Uh, he never returned. At 12 at twelve o'clock, Barrymore, finding the hall door still open, became alarmed, and lighting a lantern, went in search of his master. The day had been wet, and Sir Charles's footmarks were easily traced down the alley. Halfway down there, this walk, there was a gate which leads out onto the moor. There were indications that Sir Charles had stopped for some little time here. He then proceeded down the alley, and it was one of the far it was at the far end that his body was discovered. One fact which has not been explained is the statement of Barrymore that his master's footprints altered their character from the time that he passed the moor gate, and that he appeared from thence onward to have been walking upon his toes. Was he running? One Murphy, a gypsy horse dealer, was on the moor at no great distance at the time, but he appears by his own confession to have been the worse for drink. He declares that he heard cries, but is unable to state from what direction they came. No signs of violence were to be discovered upon Sir Charles's person, and though the doctor's evidence pointed to an almost incredible facial distortion, so great that Dr. Mortimer refused to believe at first that it was indeed his friend and patient which lay before him. That's how bad it was. Uh, it was explained that this was a symptom which is not unusual in cases of, dipsna of uh, dipsnopia? I don't know how to pronounce the word that I'm seeing here. It's, uh, I assume it's an antique word for a heart attack. Uh, and death from cardiac exhaustion. This explanation was borne out by the post-mortem examination, which showed long-standing organic disease, and the coroner's jury returned a verdict in accordance with the medical evidence. 
It is well that this is so, for it is obviously of the utmost importance that Sir Charles's heir should settle at the hall and continue the good work which has been so sadly interrupted. Had the prosaic finding of the corridor not finally put an end to the romantic stories which have been whispered in connection with the affair, it might have been difficult to find a tenant for Baskerville Hall. It is understood that the next of kin is Mr. Henry Baskerville, if he be still alive, the son of Sir Charles Baskerville's younger brother. The young man which, ha when last heard of, was in America, and inquiries are being instituted with a view of informing him of his good fortune. Uh, might be a little bit confusing there. Of course, it'll be a, it'll be a double blow if they find Sir Charles or Sir Henry in America. It'll be good news and bad news, <laughs> right? I mean, the bad news will be that you you've lost your father, uh, that he died. The good news will be that you've inherited this hall, and uh, what we can only presume is still a vast fortune. Uh, Doctor Mortimer refolded his paper and replaced it in his pocket. Those are the public facts, Mr. Holmes, in connection with the death of Sir Charles Baskerville. I must thank you, said Sherlock Holmes, for calling my attention to a case which certainly presents some features of interest. I had observed some, some newspaper comments at the time, but I was exceedingly preoccupied with that little affair of the Vatican cameos. And in my anxiety, in my anxiety to oblige the Pope, I lost touch with several interesting English cases. This article, you say, contains all the public facts? It does. Then let me have the private ones. He leaned back, put his fingertips together, and assumed his most impassive and judicial expression. In doing so, said Mr. Mortimer, who had begun to show signs of some strong emotion, I am telling you that which I have not confided to anyone. My motive for withholding it from the coroner's inquiry is that a man of science shrinks from placing himself in the public position of seeming to endorse a popular superstition. We're getting a little hint here of why he brought that old document. If he thinks there was foul play, why didn't he just bring the newspaper account? It's because they're connected. Uh, I had the, fur the further motive that Baskerville Hall, as the paper says, would certainly remain untenanted if anything were done to increase its already grim reputation. For both these reasons, I thought that I was justified in telling rather less than I know, since no practical good could result from it. But with you, there is no reason why I should not be perfectly frank. The moor is very sparsely inhabited and those who live near each other are thrown very much together. For this reason, I saw a good deal of Sir Charles Baskerville, with the exception of Mr. F of Mr. Franklin of Laughter Hall and Mr. Stapleton, the naturalist, there are no other men of education within many miles. Sir Charles was a retiring man, but the chance of his illness brought us together, and a community of interests in science kept us so. He had brought back much scientific information from South Africa, and many such Many a charming evening we have spent together discussing the comparative anatomy of the Bushman and the Hottentot. Please tell me <laughs> that Sir Charles did not bring back bodies from South Africa. Please tell me that. <laughs> Please tell me he did not bring back heads or hands. <laughs> Again, let's just hurry on. Uh, within the last few months, it became increasingly plain to me that Sir Charles' nervous system was strained to the breaking point. He had taken this legend which I have read to you exceedingly to heart, so much so that although he would walk in his grounds, nothing would induce him to go out upon the moor at night. Incredible as it may be to you, as it may appear to you, Mr. Holmes, he was honestly convinced that a dreadful fate overhung his family, and certainly the records which he was able to give of his ancestors were not encouraging. I wonder what's in the library at Baskerville Hall. Oh my that old document, probably, but what else? Oh, uh, the idea of some ghastly presence constantly haunted him, and on more than one occasion he asked me whether I had my, in my medical journeys at night ever seen any strange creature or heard the baying of a hound. The latter question he put to me several times, and always with a voice which vibrated with excitement. I can well remember driving up to his house in the evening, some three weeks before the fatal event. He chanced to be at his hall door. I, just, I had descended from my gig and was standing in front of him when I saw his eyes fix themselves over my shoulder and stare past me with an expression of the, utmost, of the most dreadful horror. I whisked round and had just time to catch a glimpse of something which I took to be a large black calf passing at the head of the drive. So excited and alarmed was he that I was compelled to go down to the spot where the animal had been and look around for it. It was gone. However, the incident appeared... To, uh, appeared to make the worst impression upon his mind. I stayed with him all evening, and it was on that occasion to explain the emotion which he had shown that he confided to my keeping the narrative which I've read to you when I first came. I mention this small episode because it assumes some importance in view of the tragedy which followed.
but I was convinced at the time that the matter was entirely trivial and that his excitement had no justification. But you saw something. <laughs> you didn't see much, but you saw something. Uh, anyway, uh, it was at my advice that Sir Charles was about to go to London. His heart was, I knew, affected, and the constant anxiety in which he lived, however chimerical the cause of it might be, was evidently having a serious effect upon his health. I thought that a few months among the distractions of town would send him back a new man. Mr. Stapleton, our mutual friend who's been described as a naturalist, uh, who was much concerned at his state of health, was of the same opinion, and the last instant came this terrible catastrophe. On the night of Sir Charles's death, Barrymore the butler, who had made the discovery, sent Perkins the groom on horseback to me, and as I was sitting up late, I was able to reach Baskerville Hall within an hour of the event. I checked and corroborated all the facts which were mentioned at the inquest. I followed the footsteps down the yew alley. I saw the spot at the moor gate where he seemed to have waited. I remarked the change in the shape of the prints after that. I noted there were no other footprints, uh, save those of Barrymore on the soft gravel. And I finally, I carefully examined the body, which had not been touched until my arrival. Sir Charles lay on his face, his arms out, his fingers dug into the ground, and his features convulsed with some strong emotion to such an extent that I could hardly have sworn to his identity. There was certainly no physical injury of any kind, but one false statement was made by Barrymore at the inquest. He said that there were no traces upon the ground round the body. He did not observe any, but I did, some little distance off, but fresh and clear. Footprints? Footprints. A man or a woman's? Dr. Bornemer looked strangely at us for an instant, and his voice sank almost to a whisper as he answered, Mr. Holmes, they were the footprints of a gigantic hound. <laughs> now, <laughs> I want to point out one thing to you, two things really. One, that whole chapter is what we now refer to as an info dump. That whole chapter is just a big, gigantic block of exposition. Have you ever heard it done more fun? I swear, have you ever seen an exposition dump in any work of fiction more enjoyable than that? <laughs> I have not. I know of only a couple of cases even to rival it. And the second thing I want to point out is how perfect that final, the ending of the chapter is. It is, I don't, I'm a critic. I don't often say that anything in fiction is perfect. That is perfect. That is perfectly done. Show me a person who can get to the end of this chapter and not want to read the next chapter. I don't believe such a person exists. No matter whether Sherlock Holmes is your taste or not, I don't believe such a person exists. So there you go. That is chapter two of The Hound of the Basketballs. Oh, I noticed this little, this little chimp right there. I wonder if this little paperback will survive the reading. We will go on to chapter three next time. No pauses, no delays, the voice of the people. <laughs> The people have spoken, so we'll wrap this up for now. We'll go on to chapter three next time. <laughs> Thank you, Motu.